Okay, let's talk about memory, probably the biggest area of study in cognitive psychology. Without it, we wouldn't just lose our past, we would also have trouble imagining the future or even considering alternative possibilities. For that matter, we wouldn't be able to learn anything. So there goes knowing how to ride a bike or walk, not to mention language is totally out the window if you can't remember words or how they go together. Without memory, we couldn't do much at all. Now, despite how central it is to our lives, we often don't realize how limited and crappy our memory can be. For example, throughout your life, you've probably gotten loose change back from a cashier hundreds, maybe thousands of times. So you have absolutely seen what a US penny looks like. But do you actually remember what a penny looks like? For example, which of these is a penny? Like, you've seen them before and you know what a penny is, so you should remember, right? So pause, look through these, decide which one you think is the real penny, and then I'll give you the answer. So in case you're wondering, it's the one up here in the upper right. And even if you got this correct, by the way, don't get too excited because if you saw any one of these fake designs on a coin that was in your hand, among other coins, there's almost no chance you would notice anything wrong with it, despite it not matching up to the template you'd seen so many times before. You've seen them thousands of times, so you'd think your brain would have stored that information, right? But unless you really paid attention to the details, your brain likely didn't store all that minor stuff. Only the gist of it is what gets stored. And that's how it is with everything. We're exposed to way more information than we actually end up holding on to. And even if we could store every little detail we're exposed to, do you really want to remember the color of the shirt of every person you've ever walked past or seen in a, like a crowd shot at a stadium? No. Do you, do you really want to remember exactly how many tiles there are in your bathroom just because your eyes have passed over those tiles a bunch of times? No. Or does it make sense instead for memory to be a system that, that only stores important bits and kind of summary information that's good enough for our functional purposes, good enough for us to get through life and thrive and survive? That's what we're going to be talking about through all the coming videos, what our memory system is for and how it actually works, which you'll find is nothing like a camera, nothing like a computer storing pictures or videos or documents, but how do we then begin to study something so complicated as human memory? Well, one of the earliest kind of systematic attempts was by a guy named Erman Ebbinghaus. And at the time, most people didn't think higher mental processes like memory could be studied experimentally because there are just too many complicated variables involved, right? Higher thought, we can't study that in a laboratory. But Ebbinghaus had just, he had just set up the, the third psychology laboratory ever in Germany. It was the same year that uh, Wilhelm Wundt started the first ever psych laboratory in the world, and, and this was also in the same country in Germany. And Ebbinghaus found a way to study memory by starting really simple. He wanted to start really simple in order to control for a lot of potential confounds in the research. He wanted to get really to the nitty gritty of what is basic memory. So we wanted to test something that was easy enough for a person to memorize, like say, a list of simple words, except words are kind of tainted by pre-existing associations and past learning, right? That's a confound itself. So he came up with a clever idea of memorizing lists of nonsense syllables. All of them were three letters long, so it was the same length, none of them were words, so there are these little three-letter trigrams that combine a consonant, a vowel, and a consonant, but they don't sound like any existing word in his language to minimize prior associations. So he actually came up with more than 2,000 of these nonsense syllables, then he'd mix them up in a box, randomly pull out some set of them, and write it down in his experimental notebook. So he ended up with a ton of lists of these nonsense syllables for him to work with. Then, for the memory part, he turned on a metronome, so basically a little timekeeper, just tick tock, tick tock, to provide a regular beat. And using the same voice inflection, he tried not to you know, say it really excitedly or anything like that, using the same voice inflection at the exact same rate based on the metronome, he would read these lists aloud many times, over and over and over again, and try to remember them afterward. So he'd read it through it once and see if he could remember the whole list. Then he'd read it through again, see if he could remember the whole list. He'd repeat this procedure over and over and over with a list until he could successfully remember the whole list. And again, these are a bunch of arbitrary nonsense syllables, so it's not as easy to remember as normal words, right? It does take a little practice. So let's say, for example, for one of these lists of a certain length, it took a thousand seconds, right? 1,000 seconds, a little over 15 minutes. 
to learn one of the short lists. He would then write down a thousand seconds as his initial learning time. That's how long it took to learn it, to put it into memory good enough that he could repeat it back. Of course, once some time had gone by, like a few hours pass, or even just a few minutes, it's certainly a few days, he would forget a lot of the list, right? That's normal. We don't remember everything even when we have learned it and remembered it at one point. It doesn't mean it sticks around. So then after a certain delay, he tried different delays, but after a certain delay, he would come back and he would relearn the list. Maybe the second time it only took 400 seconds to get it right for a list that originally took him a thousand seconds to learn. So it showed that not all of the info had been forgotten, right? So he didn't remember the whole list anymore when it came time to, to restudy it, but it didn't take him, he wasn't starting from scratch. It didn't take him a full thousand seconds. So it showed that some of the info was still in there. The fact that it was quicker the second time proved that something had been stored even for this meaningless set of syllables. Like there was a time savings when relearning something. And he did this for a lot of different lists while manipulating some variables like different lengths of delay. And he found that shorter delay intervals meant fewer repetitions are needed to relearn a list. That makes sense. Whereas if you go longer between when you first learned it and when you try and relearn it, more of it is forgotten. So for example, basically he's, you know, this is what the, the data might look like simplified. He's basically using a subtractive method. He's recording the original learning time, like a thousand seconds, then recording the time it took for, you know, uh, relearning after a 19 minute delay or after a one day delay or after a six day delay to relearn the same list and the difference between those two numbers. That's what's called relearning savings. So this first example had a 600 second savings when relearned 19 minutes later, but only 350 seconds of savings when he's relearning after a day you know, a day after the initial learning. <clears throat> so from that and doing it for a ton of different lists, he ended up with this data here, what's called the savings curve or the relearning curve, sometimes called the forgetting curve. Basically, it shows the percent of learning time that's saved depending on how long of a delay between the first time you learned it and the second time you learn it that you used. So it's a negatively accelerating curve, meaning the forgetting happens fastest in the time right after you first learned it, but then it kind of slows down with longer delays. So after a couple of days have passed between the initial learning, like there's not much difference between that and a month passing. In both cases, about 20% of the effort is shaved off when you go to relearn it again later. Now, obviously this isn't the perfect way to study memory or anything. For one thing, it's all based on him as the only subject. So it's hard to generalize it to all humans without more testing. Now, in 2015, someone at the University of Amsterdam did replicate his work with one participant spending like 70 hours learning and relearning lists after these same delays, and they did find the same pattern. In fact, just like Ebbinghaus, they found a bit of a jump right at the one day mark before it went back to the normal curve pattern. We'll see why that, that one day mark is, is important with memory when we come back to talk more about long term memory. But meanwhile, I want to use the example of Ebenhaus's famous study to distinguish a couple different ways that we might measure memory if we're bringing it into a laboratory trying to study it even today. So what Ebbinghaus was doing in his test phase when he tried to remember all the syllables on a given list, that's a memory test we call a recall test. When we ask someone to recall something, they have to produce it from memory. It's an active and effortful process usually. It's like a fill in the blank or a short answer question on a test where you have to retrieve the info rather than just choosing among some options that are right in front of you. There are a few common ways we do recall tests, by the way, you'll see a lot of these. So in studying memory, um, you might see like serial recall, free recall and so on. And here's what that means. Like a participant might be asked, for example, to do serial recall where they have to remember all of the items in the exact order they were presented. Or they might be asked to do a free recall task where you just try to remember as many items as possible, but the order you retrieve them in doesn't matter. Finally, we sometimes use something called queued recall when studying memory. In that one, you learn the memory items with some sort of cue. So for example, one way we might do it is you learn pairs of words like bank and tiger or chair and love, silent and lamp and so on. And later on, when we get to the memory test, right? Maybe there's some delay first, but eventually we get to the memory test. We present you with a cue, right? A, a memory prompt. Like in this case, we might, we might provide you with tiger and you would have to produce the other word. You would have to remember bank is the right answer. 
But in all of these recall tests here, if you draw a blank, you're out of luck, right? On the other hand, there are, all, there are also uh, recognition tests of memory. And in this kind of memory test, you just have to select or identify items that you were exposed to previously. Like in, in one study, you might see 500 pictures presented to you for 10 seconds each. You're trying to remember all 500 of these pictures. You only get to see them for 10 seconds. Like you're not going to be able to recall all the details, right? But we might have you come back to the lab after a delay, maybe 24 hours later. You come back the next day and we're going to sit you down again at the same computer and we're going to show you some pictures. But this time, half of those pictures come from the ones you saw before and half of them are brand new that weren't there the first day. And for each picture, we're going to ask you if it was in the original set from yesterday. Now here, you've just got to say yes or no, right? And we can see how accurate you are, how well you can distinguish the ones you did see from the ones you didn't. That's a memory test. But like, you don't have to go back and retrieve the whole picture in your mind. Even just like a sense of familiarity is enough. A little sense of recognition is sufficient. So this kind of memory test, it's essentially like an exam with multiple choice questions. As long as you can recognize the answer, you don't have to recall all the details. And as you might guess, recognition memory usually has a, a much greater capacity than, than recall memory. In other words, it's easier to have a sense of familiarity that you've seen something before than it is to kind of actively and, and effortfully retrieve that information yourself. So here's an example of a memory test, really simple one. Without cheating and looking at any nearby technology, don't look around, can you draw the Apple company logo? Like you might pause, grab a pen and paper and try and like draw the logo. You've obviously seen it a bunch of times. Even if you don't use Apple products, you've no doubt seen other people with their Mac laptop open or holding an iPhone or you've seen ads for Apple products. So you've definitely been exposed to the stimulus a lot. So again, if you need to grab a pen and paper, pause the video, do your best to draw the Apple logo without cheating, then unpause the video. Okay, now on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you in your logo? What I might do is bring a bunch of people into the lab and have them do this task, a task just like this. And I could grade them on like how many elements of the Apple design they got right or wrong. And it doesn't have to be Apple, right? It could be anything that we've all kind of seen. Uh, or alternatively, a different way I could study this, I could just show a bunch of possible logos and ask, which is the correct one? So this is just like the penny test we did before. Again, you might pause the video and make your choice before moving on. So the answer in this case is the one in the bottom right. The leaf goes to the right in the logo, as does the bite, and the leaf isn't directly attached to the top. There's also a little bump at the bottom. Now, we've all done tests like both of these, right? So, so uh, in, in research, you'll often see us do both recall and recognition style tests. So for example, here's um, data we got from, from a study doing the Apple logo thing where we just ask people to draw what they remember. So a drawing version of the task. And what's funny is I've done this lesson before and I've owned Apple products. And still, if you ask me, like, let's say a year from now, you ask me to draw the logo, I'll probably get some detail wrong because you don't normally pay attention to the little details. But just to kind of practice our knowledge of the new terminology here, of these two, of these two ways of testing memory of the Apple logo, which one is a recall test and which one is a recognition test? Pause, come up with your answer. So the top one is like a multiple choice test, right? So it's recognition based. Whereas the one you're drawing from memory, that is a recall test. You have to kind of provide everything actively. And of course, there are lots of other ways we can test memory. And by the end of this all, we'll see a lot of different types of memory. But first, we need to put a little more structure on this big old topic of memory. So, oh, oops. so that brings us to a theoretical model of memory that was actually first developed in the 60s by Atkinson and Schifrin. It's called the modal model of memory. The name's kind of clunky, right? But you might think of it like having different modes of memory, different types of memory. Sometimes it's called the multi-store model of memory because it's got multiple different storage areas for different types or stages of memory. So here's the basics of the model. It's got uh, it's like an information processing flowchart here, right? So it's got a flow going from left to right in this particular model. So on the left, we've got input coming in from the environment. That would be light hitting our eyes or waves of sound pressure hitting our ears or whatever. It's our sense input from the world. 
follow that first red arrow and you can see in their model, it first goes to what they called sensory registers or sensory store, or what we now just call sensory memory. From there, it goes on to short-term memory or STM. And this is where a lot of the action happens, where we're holding information in the mind so we can use it to decide and act. But of course, we also store a lot of information more long-term. So that's the last box here, long-term memory or LTM. Notice this one has arrows going both ways. We need to send information to long-term memory if we wanna keep it around, but we also need a way to pull information back out of long-term memory so we can use it in the moment. So LTM also sends information back to STM. Now, just a, a sort of quick preview of each part before we dive into them in more depth. Sensory memory, that first step, in essence, it holds all incoming information from our senses, but only for seconds or even less, perhaps less than a second. Meanwhile, short-term memory, that next box, it can hold a few items. We'll see how much soon. And, and here we're talking about maxing out duration around 15 to 30 seconds. So that's why we call it short-term memory. It's the stuff kind of currently in your mind. Generally, what we're currently aware of is stuff in short-term memory. We can, we can directly and actively use this information, like doing a simple math problem, five times 14, that requires holding the five in short-term memory and holding the 14 in order to like do the calculation. And possibly you gotta hold intermediate values, like five times 10 and five times four before you put those together to give the final answer. So you'll notice in the flow chart here, we also mentioned the term rehearsal. This is something we can do in short-term memory, meaning like we repeat something over and over again, either out loud or in your head, but that keeps it active in short-term memory so it doesn't disappear after the usual 15 to 30 seconds. And then finally, as I said, there's long-term memory. The amount here is, let's just say lots of information, and the duration we can hold it for is, well, long, <laughs> potentially very long. We, uh, but really anything we're remembering after a couple minutes or an hour, that counts as long-term memory. So it's not just those embarrassing moments from 10 years ago. Long-term memory is kind of anything beyond short-term memory. And as we saw, this information can get transferred back to short-term memory when we want to use it, which is a process, right? Like those bi-directional arrows connecting long-term memory and short-term memory, those are processes. So we have a name for each one. Encoding is putting information into long-term memory, meaning the way we transfer info to long-term memory to store it, whereas retrieval is the act of remembering, either voluntarily or involuntarily, but where we pull information back out of long-term memory into short-term memory so we can use it in the moment. And that's it. That's the modal model. And you know, in rough outlines, this is still how we think of memory today from an information processing approach. Although we will see some details have been filled in and some improvements have been made over the years since it was first proposed. Uh, two quick things to note before we dive into sensory memory. First, the modal model emphasizes storage of information. Like they were thinking about different ways and different timescales on which information is held, kind of passively almost, but we're gonna see a little later that the modern updated version is a little more active and dynamic. All right, and second, you'll notice that for each of the stages, each of those boxes, uh, some information can slip out and be lost. Obviously, we don't remember everything. So part of researching memory is figuring out why and how that information loss happens. So we'll come back to that. But that's enough of a sort of quick introduction to memory, that modal model. In the next video, let's talk about the first type of memory from the modal model, that sensory memory.